Felix here, and welcome to this FOMC meeting, Fed special. It's the most exciting thing that's happening today. And I'm glad you're on board. I'm glad you are here. And I'm glad that you are intending to watch and breathe this live. So what's going to happen here? Well, we're going to get the actual rate decision in 30 minutes, and that's going to be followed by the press conference. And that, quite frankly, is the more important part of it, because a number is a number. But the economic um, forecasts they're going to give us, as well as the, well, what Powell's going to say, that's what the market breathes, breathes and lives on. So that's super important. If you haven't already taken advantage of this, I just posted brand new out today. Goldman's top 26 buys for rate hikes do. Here it is in its full splendor here on the left. I've bolded the stocks that I own out of those. I think four of them I own actually out of the 26, which is probably one of the, uh, the, the, the benchmarks that I like the best so far. Um, do we know any bear risk? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, so yeah, have a look at that and, and download it. It's completely free. Felix Fence at slash top 26. If my voice goes a little croaky, uh, and hence also the scarf, I apologize. Slightly scratchy throat here today. None of the following is of course, financial advice. Just a former banker, washed up economist, you know, corporate lawyer for a bit, uh, options trader uh, for now, uh, giving you his view and, and sharing you his opinions and, and hoping that you'll learn something from that and then you walk away smarter and, and able to make better decisions. So what's the first thing we're going to do? I've got a meta trade open for those of you guys in the options community know that. Uh, it's losing $124, which isn't really a big deal. What are we going to do with it? We're going to close it. Why are we going to close it? Because we like to de-risk. So I'm going to close that, and that's really, really important. And and I do that before, well, I really should do that before every major event like this because it's it's about de-risking. And the wonderful thing with, with options trading is that we have this opportunity to not be in the market and not be in the storm. You see the storm coming? You just go the other way. You just go for a nap, go to the beach, play with your golden retriever, you know, whatever. And, and that's what I would recommend um, you do as well. Avoid... The known unknowns. That's essentially the, the lesson from that. I appreciate everybody tuning in here. Lots of questions. Um, uh, Patrick, you're using the subtext. Okay, I shall try to speak a little bit more slowly and, and test the, um, the, the, the captions here. Um, ben Gador just sold all of his Tesla. Did you really? Um, yeah, what do you think is going on with NEO? Indeed. So the Chinese stocks here are a par getting pummeled. X Pang down 10%. Neo down 8%, PDV, uh, Edu down, Baba down 4%. I think this is some um, ratcheting up of, of, of sort of language by, by the, the White House, you know. There's talks of possible sanctions and all that kind of thing to prevent a dispute uh, or, you know, an, an invasion of Taiwan, all that kind of stuff. So I, I think this is probably for the benefit of you American voters uh, so that you go and vote for the really, really t tough um, you know, chief that you've got there. So I think I think that's really what that's all about. So I wouldn't pay too much attention to that, to be honest with you. But it is it is unfortunately part of the way these games are played. Let me just make everything a little bit bigger so we get a little bit more. Um, hang on. If we do that, everything gets a little bit bigger, which is a, which is beneficial, and I can make myself perhaps a little a little smaller and sort of not block everything here. So. Um, what are we looking for in this this Fed decision? Is, is is this related to the Chinese equities? No, it isn't. It really isn't. The market's broadly a little on the edge, but actually quite a lot of tech, you know, Upstart, Coin, Palantir, up like more than four percent. Nvidia is up three percent. So we're seeing a serious tech rally, and and that's also why I decided to not be in this market for for today and probably at least half of tomorrow. Just see how um, how many of Wall Street's traders have taken their medications. You know, that's really important to know. Are they on the uppers or they're on the downers? If they're on the downers, I'm, I'm back in the market. So QQQ sort of bobbing along quite nicely here today. It's trading half a percentage point up, just a little bit more than that. Um, and the calendar, here it is. This is what we're all waiting for. The Fed decision, um, 8 p.m., that's Monaco time. Uh, so that is um, in 25 minutes for you. And what are we expecting? Well, very, very, very high probability of a 75% basis uh, rate hike. And what does that mean? Well, the market should not be con concerned about that. 84% now of the market think that's true. It was 82% this morning. So that's basically guiding us. Um, 
are we going to get this shock and all one percent you know like the, like the swedes who will always like to surprise you um, i i very much doubt it i, I think they are going to do this 75 point hike the november market rate hike is also priced in already for another 75 basis points so that's another one and a half percent interest rate hike that almost brings us up to four percent and then by december the market is now very very much expecting to be somewhere between 4.25 and, and, and maybe even a little higher than that um, interest rate hike so basically we're getting to where jay powell told us we would be a couple of months back so they are kind of like following through on their promises um so what are we what are we looking for really well we're going to get economic data out from them so you're going to see obviously the, the the sort of dot plot like you know how far where are you going to go for how long are you going to stay high and that's probably going to show that they're going to stay higher for longer but we're also looking at the gdp numbers do they think that those are going to come down a bit do they think that the unemployment rate is going to go up a bit that's kind of like a bit of guidance how much pain are they willing to for us to endure for the real economy to endure uh, that's kind of the balancing act that they have there and if you watch me this morning i showed you this this chart this morning which shows quite a lot of data that is actually coming down in terms of cost the white rate here is 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 trucking the um purple one i believe no the yellow one are container freights and look at that was at like five thousand what was that? No, I think twelve thousand dollars so over twelve thousand dollars and now we're back to four thousand two hundred now that's still double what it was in 2019. And I know I have a business where we ship quite a lot of containers. And um, it used to be like 2000 something. And now it's like, what, $9,000? Are you crazy? Uh, and that obviously impacts the costs that get passed on, right? So that's that's a, a, a important. Um, so there's a style contest. That's very kind of you to say. It's, 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 this is really for the benefit of the slightly scratchy uh, throat. But I appreciate all the, um, is that, that the LGBT <laughs> chart. <laughs> yes, it's a it's a very colorful chart. Absolutely. We've got scarves on and everything today. So um, I'm buying this Neo dip, says David. OK, thanks for sharing. What other businesses do you run? No, we do quite a lot of stuff, um, trading, um, a lot sort of stuff, uh, physical things, though. Um, on every rate hike this year, we've had a positive day, says Rana. And then typically the next day, the opposite happens, right? That's a little bit at least what we've been getting with with the press conferences. Eric thinks the nation's debt problems are actually going to cause a crash. That's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, we've so far suspended all beliefs into the economic principles that at least I was taught at, at university. Um, and that's kind of what the Fed tried to pull off last year, saying, no, 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 no. Printing 40% extra money does not cause inflation. That's a rumor spread by some vicious old uh, bankers and, 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 and economists who don't believe it. And of course, it bloody does. I mean, it's pretty bleeding obvious, isn't it? Uh, so... You know, you increase supply and, and, and whatnot. Uh, this benchmark here on the screen, I'd encourage you to download it. Um, the link is above felixfriends.org slash top 26. And what does that get you? It gets you Goldman's list of their 26 stocks. They say have not just solid financials, but they're actually going to benefit from rate hikes. And we're definitely getting a rate hike today. That much is clear. So have a look at these and do some, some digging. Um, have a look particularly on... Return invested capital, that's a, that's a biggie. Have a look at uh, cash conversion. You want that to be as short as possible. And long-term earnings growth rate. Those are the kind of three key numbers I would definitely look at. So, so check it out, felixvansen.org slash top26. It's completely free. Yeah, completely free. Um, did I put the right link in, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the video? I'm not sure I did, to be honest with you. I think I might have mistyped that. Let me have a quick look. Let me have a quick look if we've got some... Uh, issues here with links because i don't like that um okay let me just log into the back end so guys we've got about 20 minutes till we get the data so use the time to ask some questions that's why we do these things live um actually the link isn't down below at all so i'll put it down below for easy easy reference um get goldman's top 26 buys benchmark and that is at sorry for the uh, for the back end ITing here. Um, it'll it'll help a lot of people, and that's why we do this. So okay, it's in the in the description now, which will be helpful. I can put it in there. Can I put it in the chat? I think I probably can as well. There we go. Eddie Vever, welcome from Stockholm. There. Um, so what is it like to live with a one percent interest rate hike? Uh, Eddie Feffy, there. How, how does that feel? Why is Neo tanking so hard tonight? Um, 
we should have options trades for rate hike expiry dates. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, if we could, if we could do that. Unfortunately, well, you can. I mean, you can trade indices, SPX, that sort of thing. Um, they expire pretty much every single day, so you, you could certainly do that. Chris wants to hold US dollars in an ISA. What ETFs can I use? Um, there will be undoubtedly some sort of US dollar ETF that'll give you um, exposure to, to I, I, would, I would imagine, um, at least US short-term treasuries. You could certainly do that. You know, some sort of US dollar bond thing. Why is the screen gone so dark? What's going on here? Why are we so dark? Crazy. Very dark suddenly. I don't know why. Maybe we'll go bright again. It's up to the it's up to the the, the, the camera gods. Uh, what color we are? Um, Toronto says the volume isn't very high on the neo drop. Okay, let's have a, have a look at the neo chart here because it is down like eight percent. Um, X Bank also down ten percent. Let's have a look at neo. Um, we don't want the minute chart. We want the day chart. Let's zoom in a little bit on that. So volume today, yeah, you say that, but it's 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 not super low either. It's sort of like that's where we are right now. There's still some trading trading time left. So yeah, it's not huge volume, but also isn't you know it's sort of roughly average volume, I I, I would say. So yeah, there's a definitely very significant sell-off. Um, bounce down to what is it? Did it stop at 1854 or thereabouts? Low was 1856. Um, no clear support there really but where it is it right now it's sort of at the july lows so let's hope that that moves up a bit um with the candle because this is not this is a really unpleasant candle um you, you don't want to be at the bottom end of a candle it just means that everybody who you know everybody wants to sell basically no one was coming to buy back in um could the market dip even if you get the expected rate hike i think it really depends on what powell says and what the kind of economics predictions are i think that's really uh, what's key here Um, practice wants to appreciate that practice. Um, you want to talk about the, 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 the dot plot. Okay. So what is the dot plot? It's one of those really random things that people came up with. This is what it looks like. So let me take a sc screenshot of that. Let me just go through it because I remember someone telling me about the dot plot and I thought that they'd lost the plot really. Didn't know what the heck it was. Um, and, um, that's normal because not everybody stares at, Fed charts and, and this kind of thing. So what is it? Each dot is a Fed president. Um, I know some of them are, are, are bigger than others, but they all come in the same shape on this on this plot. And um, you get in red, I believe, hang on, let me just see. Red dots indicate the effective right. Okay, so in red is the market. So that is the market pricing. So there and there is where the market thinks it's gonna go. And then in, in blue, you've got the Fed median. That's a bit of a fat pen. So this is this is the Fed in blue. And you can see there's a difference, right? Suddenly the market is actually predicting it's going to go higher. So we would expect the Fed to move more of the Fed presidents to vote for um, end of the year, you know, more being above 4%. So this whole thing is very likely to go up. So you're going to get more dots at the top here somewhere um, and less, less dots at the bottom. And then similarly, going forward, I would, I would assume that this is going to go up just a little bit, just a notch. In the longer run, I don't think it's going to change because they kind of want this ideal world of 2.5% interest rates with less than 2% inflation. That's kind of their, uh, their idea of uh, you know, Neverland. Um, but yeah, that's essentially what it's about. It's just each dot is one, one, one um, Fed president. And then um, we kind of match that against what the market expects in terms of Fed uh, fund futures um, and also uh, the two-year treasury, uh, which is, is, is bouncing around. What is it bouncing around at? Let's have a look. Uh, markets, bonds, US 10 years at 3.5, crikey. And here it is. The US two-year is at 3.98. So that's kind of like an indicator of where the market sees near-term interest rates uh, to go. So basically, four percent, and and you know that's that's significantly higher. Say so in um, in middle of June, we were at three point four percent, so we got six zero point six percent higher, which should mean the market should be down about six percentage points, something like that. Uh, so is is that true? Since 
let's open this as a proper chart. Can we do that? Uh, launch full chart view, indeed. We can do that. Uh, the, thank you very much. So let's look at a day chart here and we can see, see what's going on there. We remove money and we add to it, say, SPX. Um, new price scale. So since, yeah, it's not super logical because, yeah, so that caused a dip and then we rallied back up. And then from, we went from 4,300 down to 3,800 or something like that. Let me measure that. Um, I was measuring the wrong scale. How can I get it to measure the other scale? No, I can't. But anyway, it's moved, it's moved from 4,300 down to 3,900. So that's about 400 points. We lost about 10%. So probably a bit of an overreaction um, by a couple of percentage points, but it, it, there's a logic behind the, the, the direction it's moving in. I hope that, that answer made, made some sense. Um, did I miss any questions here? Uh, the, the delay with the solid state battery, that isn't really news, is it? I mean, we've known that since the, the last earnings call in, in the Q&A, they were talking about that. Uh, William Lee said there'd be some delay on that and it'd be, be out sometime next year, but he didn't give a date. So I, I don't think that is it in itself. I think if you look at what is down, I think that kind of answers your question. It's the whole Chinese uh, space of Xpang, Neo, Ehang, PDV, EDU, Baba, Baidu, they're all down. So this is not specific to one stock. This is just the entire Chinese universe um, talks about potential sanctions to prevent you know, an invasion of Taiwan, that kind of a nonsense, which I think is essentially a, a, a sort of desperate attempt to win the midterms. I think this is really what it's about. And, and, and you know, the markets lap up all sorts of stuff. Uh, but uncertainty is one thing the market really doesn't like. Now, there is some positivity. Upstart, for example, looking pretty good. Palantir up 427, 4.27% to 795. And that's not quite where we wanted to be, but still improving. Um, PayPal up 2.3%. Lucid also up. AMD, Macy's all up almost two percentage points. And then sort of the, the big guns, the Microsoft up 1.4%. Adobe recovering a bit, 1% up, Netflix up a third of a percent, Amazon slightly in the green. So uh, all of that is kind of kind of positive. Um, but uh, really, the big question is what happens here with, with the rate hike decision in, in the next 10 minutes or so. What's a good India, Southern China, uh, Asia ETF, says Ian. Yeah, I, you know, I've looked for some. Part of the problem is that trading costs and fees are really very high if you go into some of those markets india as well so their costs are pretty high uh, so i've, I've yet I, I used to own an actively managed fund I can't remember what it was called it's actually just been closed i, I saw a lot of it a while back and it didn't do very well so i think it's a it's a, it's a tough space um did i miss much stefan uh, stefan um, the 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 rate decision comes out in about 10 minutes um, so we, we get that uh, on, on, on the hour, basically on the dot. And then half an hour later, we get, let me show it to you, uh, half an hour later, we get the Fed press conference. And that's really the juicy part of this. The number is a number, but hearing Jay Powell speak, that's really, really what matters. Let me just... Okay, let me just mute Bloomberg there so I could hear that. Um, David said the easiest exposure to the dollar is something like an S&P 500 fund. Um, yeah, that's one way of doing it. But then obviously you have a lot of um, stock exposure. If you just wanted cash, then you could find some sort of Forex. Well, probably treasuries, I would have thought. Anyone, any lithium stocks? Well, don't let um, Robert hear us. We've got an entire lithium channel dedicated on the Discord community, with, uh, which divides the, the good from the bad. Felix friends, poll 75 to 100 basis points. All right, let's do that. I think that's quite a fun idea. Let me um, put that in there. Um, you can see me set up a poll. Do you ever see the back end of this? That's what it looks like. Um, so I go into, actually, no, you know what I do? I just open it on YouTube. I open myself on YouTube, watching myself. No, that's not the one. 
Which one is it? This one, the one that's live. Crazy. Um, I pause it and then, right. Let me see what you guys know. Um, how much will the Fed raise rates, raise ways, raise rates today? Um, 0.75%, 1%. I think they're really the only, the only answers on there. Should we, should we add an option for a 0.5%? For anybody out there who's, who's that minded, all right, let, let, let's see what you guys come back in with. Um, and um, I was going to say, yeah, so when, when, when Powell speaks, which obviously will not be for another half hour, so um, I won't be talking over him. I'll just give you notes. So I'll, I'll pull up my whiteboard uh, as usual. And I'll be, I'll be writing notes to give you some perspective and some kind of guidance as to what it means, what he's saying, because I appreciate not everybody watches every <laughs> Fed press conference. There is some of you have a life. Um, I enjoy watching Fed press conferences. I'm a, I'm a bit, bit of a strange chap in that sense. Um, Hoping for 100 points. Uh, let's do it. Oh, crikey. Some of you guys, you just want to get it over and done with, right? And, and, I, and I totally get that. I, I, I totally get that sense of like, can we just get this over and done with? And then in November, only do half a point. And then in, in, in December, do a quarter point. And then we are, we are going to get the rally that we all are looking forward to. I, I think, generally speaking, the market would appreciate that. But I don't think that's the way Fed minds work. Um, Fed to hike and hammer home hawkish message. That's Bloomberg's take on that. But that's a 50-50. Um, any other major news the average adult will be worth a hundred thousand dollars by 2024 so um time to build an extra income stream guys if you haven't already you, you know what to do uh, check out our options program down below that's how we make money or join our coaching programs and we get you to money i literally have now uh, eight minutes left here up to the the um the fed interest rate decision um which could be the third three quarter, quarter percentage point rate hike this year uh, which is really a staggering amount of interest rate increases in a very very short period of time so let's see how that comes out um, um the forecast what's the forecast all right let me show it to you guys as well uh, who, who've just uh, come come in on this so um right let me show you where we are right now so basically by year end the market expects interest rates to be somewhere between 4 and 4.25% by the end of December. Um, and, and we are expecting today to go to 3%. So today we're going to expect a 70, you know, 0.75% interest rate increase. And, and, and um, that will amount to, you know, taking scarfs off weather. And uh, it makes me hot around the collar. Uh, think about all the money destroyed with interest rate hikes. Three percentage points is kind of where I, I would expect that we're going to end up today. Um, so... Let me move it up a little bit so you can see it. Right. How will the market react to this? Well, the market expects the 75 basis point hike. Uh, that's a done deal. That's priced in. But what really matters is what does Jay Powell say afterwards? It's a press conference afterwards. Is he going to come out with a kind of tough language saying, you know, we will we will uh, keep rates up as long as it takes kind of thing like he did at the Jackson Hole speech, in which case the market is... Well, if he says exactly the same wording as a Jackson Hole, the market's going to like it because we already know that. But if he taffens a little bit more on the language and that can literally be a word or two, then uh, the market isn't going to like it. So it's it's literally 50-50 where this heading, which is why I, you want to see my options portfolio today? Well, we're trying to close out of Meta. Why isn't that closed? I'd really like to close that before this comes out. Uh... Okay, hang on. Let me just move this over here for a second. One second. Edit, select it. Uh, review. Okay, let's hope that closes. I guess I should have done that a little bit earlier. Um, has been submitted. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so yeah, generally speaking, if you're a trader, you, you want to de-risk around these uh, these kind of events because you know you don't want stuff to slap you in the face um, when when you know something unpredictable is about to happen. And, and look at the market, look how insane it is. Uh, up starts up 7%, SOS up 5%, and then on the other side of the coin, uh, X pangs down 10%. Like that's kind of like the, the schizophrenia that's going on in the market here at the moment. Everyone's like, oh my God, panic if at all possible. 
Um, DR says 727 viewers, just 130 likes. Come on, guys and girls. Come on, let's get that number up to something a bit more respectable. Um, the one next to you, I appreciate the like. Thank you very much. Um, TG also, truly appreciate that. Uh, it, it makes such a difference. You have no idea uh, to the, the outreach. If you guys all hit the like button, we'll have a couple of thousand people on here. Um, if you don't, it's just you and me and um, my chief financial analyst. There she is. This is Tallulah, if you hadn't met her before. She does all the research, all the thinking around here. So uh, I appreciate uh, all the encouragements here. Yeah, I mean, all this war talk, I'm not really a big, big fan of that. Um, really, like, you have to kind of focus with your investing on what you can control. So, you know, you can look at that and go, well, I'm going to de-risk. I'm going to have less exposure to that part of the world. I think that's a fair, fair thing to do. But I think spending your day, like, watching that kind of stuff isn't really going to get you anywhere. Um She's Meta CFO. Um, where do rates need to go to effectually affect inflation? That's an intelligent question, Nick. I appreciate that. Uh, essentially, what we need to achieve here is one, a slightly brighter camera would be nice. I don't know why we can't can't manage that. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, sometimes that does the trick. And secondly, we need markets to expect rates to keep rising or to keep staying high. That's actually the powerful tool that the Fed has. It's not so much about the rate, the, the number per se. It's about where do you think it's going to go in six months or in 12 months. And that's why we look so much into what the chair pal says after the rate hikes as then giving us some guidance of where it's going to go. That's really the important part here to understand that. Cats, cats are best at these times, absolutely. I think Tallulah deserves a full screen appearance, doesn't she? We have three minutes left. Tallulah, any 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 bets, any thoughts on where we're going to go? Okay, now you just see a furry bottom. Um, <laughs> right, so a little street kitten on my shoulder. Um, if you haven't already, guys, take advantage of the Goldman's um, watch list at the top, the benchmark, Felix Schwenzer Log slash top 26. It's really, really quite useful to go through these and see what stocks that those guys are, are looking at. Um, am I going to close the the Meta Iron Condor? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've just sent it off. Um, so yeah, I, I would recommend... Well, generally speaking, anything that's sort of close-ish to break even, like that meta trade, which isn't like sort of right, super, super, super safe, I, I, I would generally speaking close those, absolutely. Uh, so um, if the Ukraine war ends, will it help the market, Patrick? Yes, it'll bring down inflation. It'll bring down commodity inflation. It'll bring gas and oil prices down. I'm trying to get closer so that the camera makes me brighter again. It's really weird. It's being quite sensitive today, isn't it? Why is it doing that? I don't know. Anyway, it looks like I'm sitting in the dark. I'm not. But yeah, so definitely. That would definitely help. But I wouldn't I wouldn't really count on Putin here to help. Uh, Aku, have we touched on China today? Yeah, a bit of politics there. And I think that's why we're seeing, seeing the, the Chinese stocks tanking. Um, Ukraine won't solve the real global problems. You know, there is a structural problem with supply chain and so on, definitely. That won't just disappear, but it would help. Yeah, Steve, I, I know what you mean. The, the background is, is, is a bit bright today. I don't really know what's going on there, but normally, normally the camera manages to handle that and, and not get too... See, there we go. We're getting a little bit brighter. You see that? You see that? Weird, isn't it? Now, now we're getting back to kind of normality here. All right, enough of the camera setup talk. Um, and Andrea, you're quite right. But the, the camera seems to be, never mind about the camera. Right, here we go. We are almost there. Um, uh, hit the like button, guys. I do appreciate that and everybody encouraging that very, very much. Uh, so do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? We are almost there, literally um, seconds away from it. Um, and... We're going to stare at the screen, fret, chew our fingernails, stroke cats, golden retrievers, anything you've got within arm's length, pull an ear. Um, anonymous, um, I never assume any knowledge for any of my coaches, coaching or, or programs uh, whatsoever, because I don't think that's helpful. So I basically assume you know nothing. And um, here we go. All right. Interest rates a decision is in... Okay. 
No, it's not. We haven't got the key number yet. We just got the, the projections. Um, the projections are a lot less important. Um, obviously, they're going to be higher, but really, okay, we got it. We got the 75 basis point rate hike. It's confirmed. Uh, it's exactly as we expected, and that's good news. We want it to be as expected. And the market's doing what? Well, look at that QQQ chart down here, dropping one percentage point um, in that crikey in that minute i mean everybody knew it right what are these people smoking but now it's coming back up because everybody's just saying what i'm saying you see that here it's coming back up uh, so i i would not expect the market to tank that much on that news because we kind of knew that we were expecting that um but yeah let's see how that pans out very very significant drop on the announcement um now why is that because the longer term projections the one year that's probably the one that's actually hurting us here the most that number there in red, the 4.6%, that's a whopping increase over where we thought this was going to be a, a month ago. So that's really what's hurting the market here. I think it's not the rate decision that we've got going on here. Um, and we will load up the economic projections here in a second as well, because that is worth going through. I'll put it up for you in a moment, but let's just have a look at this. So what are interest rate projections? Well, where do we see interest rates going essentially? Um, and if they are going to go much higher for much longer. So in the very long term, and that's what I was saying before this, this came out, I was saying everybody is going to think it's going to be 2.5%. That's basically what the Fed key always keeps saying. Um, in one year, however, this is a terrible number. Let me get a red pen to indicate pain. So this number here, 4.6% in a year's time. So that means the expectation is that interest rates are not just going to go to 4.2%, but to 4.6% in 2023. And that extra, you know, 0.4% or so could cost the market another 4%. That would sort of be the rational reaction to it. Uh, so therefore, that's significant. That's very, very significant. And um, that's, that's a big move. That's a very substantial move that we've got there on that one-year forecast. Um, uh, you see mortgage defaults if it goes to 4.6%. Well, yeah, that would obviously then push the the 30 year, you know, what was that? Push it up to 7% or something like that. A very, very significant increase. Um, so the rate hike, anybody who just missed it, it went up by 0 0.75 percentage points. That is as expected. And that in itself is not a problem. So the increase here or 0.75 percentage points or 75 basis points, if you subscribe to that kind of language, is exactly as expected and therefore isn't really a shock. But so why is the market down then on this news? Well, it's only down a little bit. So we've gone from 291 in the QQQ to 287. That's not really a huge move. Let's have a look at the SPX. Um, similar, I'd say, in terms of percentage. Yeah, we dropped about a percentage point in a bit here on that announcement um, of the rate projections, the forward-looking expectation of our rates are going to be in a year's time. They're still, in, you know, 4.6% in a year's time. Well, that's going to, that's going to hurt. Um, so treasury year, year, yields are surging to 4.11%. Uh, that's not good for the stock market. Uh, Yusuf, thank you very much for asking. Yes, I will stream the, the Jay Powell speech. That's actually what I'm here for. That's the interesting bit. Numbers anybody can read, but the Jay Powell speech is really where it's at. So um, let me have a look then at what the Fed just put out. They normally put out minutes of this. Let me have a look. Um, today is what, 21st? Where is it? Press releases, speeches. Okay, let's have a look. Press release, possibly. Um, right. Release economic projections. Here we go. That's that's the excitement um, that we want. Here's the FOMC statement. And here is the economic projections, exciting lives we live, <laughs> don't you think? Uh, what did you do today? I read the FOMC statement from the Federal Reserve. It was riveting. Um, recent indicators point to modest growth in spending and production. Job gains have been robust in recent months. So that's bad, right? So both of that 
is, is pretty bad. Unemployment rate has remained low. So I'm going to color code this. Red, bad, green, good. If you are from China, I apologize. It's the wrong way around. Inflation remains elevated, reflecting supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic, higher food and energy prices, and broader price pressures. Russia's war against Ukraine um, is causing tremendous human hardship. The war, okay, that's always the language that they use. They're highly attentive to inflation risk, same language as usual. So this is sort of like neither here nor there. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment and inflation at the rate of 2% over the longer run. In support of these goals, the committee decided to raise the rates um, to 3% and anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. So that's kind of like what we expect. It's not really new language, but it also isn't good. In addition, the committee will continue reducing its holding in treasury securities and debt as described in the plans of reducing blah de blah de blah so That's everything we know already. Strongly committed. That's a new word. I don't think we've seen this strongly before. Uh, in assessing the appropriate stance of monetary policy, the committee will continue to monitor the implications of information and they be prepared to adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate if risks emerge that it could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. Okay, so that's kind of the usual as well. Um, wide range of information, blah de blah de blah um, Yeah, so that doesn't really, not a lot. I mean... More, more or less what we already know, but they're just highlighting that the data isn't what they want it to be at all. Now, if we go into projections here, it's a lovely client browser does not accept. Okay. Come on, Federal Reserve. Give me a link that works. Apparently not. What about the accessible materials? Um, okay, here we go. We can look at it like like that, like that. So, the projections for GDP for next year: one point two percent for next year. So they're still saying there isn't going to be a recession, which is kind of um, highly unlikely. I'd say the unemployment rate they see going to four point four percent only. I don't think it's going to go any higher. Um, interesting, and. They think by the end of next year, core PCE inflation is going to go down to 3.1%. Okay, that's, let's hope we get there. And the federal funds rate, and that's the that's the tough one here, 4.6% by uh, next year, the median level. So they, they think on average, we're going to have a Fed fund rate of 4.6% next year. That's ouch, considering that we're at 3% now, right? That's that's painful. So that's really what, what what's hurting us here. Um, Nikon, thanks very much for the subscribe. Um, Robert says, uh, welcome here. Um, somebody was asking about lithium, Robert, so you might want to engage on that. I appreciate everybody tuning in. And I would, of course, really appreciate it if you, if you smash that like button as well to show people that this isn't complete gibberish, um, just an old economist, former banker, uh, trying to guide you through the data that's coming out here. We will live stream in literally 20 minutes the Fed, the Jay Powell speech. So if you want to go and make yourself a nice cup of coffee or something, then this is the time to do it as we kind of go through the economic projections here uh, from, from the Fed, right? Um, change in real GDP, unemployment rate, that isn't particularly useful. That's just like data, data, data. Um, okay, this is basically the dot plot, if you will. So let's make that full screen. It's one of the least... Um, one of the most confusing charts that anybody has ever come up with. Um, this is what you need the metaverse for, you see. You could stand there and, and, and you know, really see it in 3D. At least that's what Zuckerberg seems to think. He's down 75 billion this year. So if your portfolio is down a little bit, don't feel too bad for yourself. <laughs> but then he did start with a pretty healthy number. So where are we? Where are our, our averages? Um, so... Okay, let me move this down a little bit. Can you see that? Yes, I think you can. So in 2020, the Fed presidents and their infinite wisdom think we are going to be essentially at 4.25% interest rate by the end of this year. And then, and that's really the change here, for 2023, they think we are going to be at 46 to 5% on average. And you can see how evenly spread that is, 4.8 to 4.3 and 4.6. 
So it could go either way, right? I mean, it could potentially head towards five percentage points. And then for 2024, everybody is, is, is a free thinker and nobody's got any idea where rates are going to go and, and really who cares uh, what happens in 2024. But this is, this is quite staggering that six Fed presidents want interest rates to be at 4.87% um, in, in, in 2023. So the rate increases are not going to stop in December from what they're saying, is, uh, saying at the moment. And we had an expectation that it would stop essentially by December, possibly in early in the year, we might get another quarter percentage point and then things would turn around. And this is an entirely different story that we're being told here. Uh, so that's going to hurt somewhat. Um, the market reacting to it pretty smoothly, but then probably, you know, most Wall Street bankers haven't been able to find these numbers yet. You know, they're not all that smart. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm actually super excited. We're just uh, onboarding a new coach to the community who has been an investment banker for 20 years. He's literally been on the floor of the, the LME in London and stuff. Uh, and he's going he's gonna, to um, uh, really uh, ramp up our, our teaching in the, in the coaching community. So that's very, very exciting. If you guys want to check that out, links down below, felixfriends.org slash call is how you get there. Do you want to see it? There it is. Felixfriends.org slash, oh, sorry, Felixfriends.org slash coaching. Uh, that's it. Check that out. Felixfriends.org slash coaching. Uh, that really is suitable for people who have at least a five-figure portfolio. And then you can work with myself and these really amazing people directly. Um, I, I would I would beg to differ that, that Robert knows nothing about lithium. I, you know, just because something goes up because it's a meme stock doesn't mean that uh, you should be buying it. Uh, so yeah, Robert, I'm, 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 I've got your back on that one. Um, LAC, you know, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. Um, so I'm, I'm shrouded in darkness again for unknown reasons. I think the lamp behind me is slightly too bright, but you can't really do much, much about that. Um, strawberry green tea, what's all, all that about? So we, if you've just joined us, we got the 75% basis, 75% hike, basis point hike that we were expecting to get, and that in itself isn't really a problem. But what is a problem is the expectation that we might be at 4.6 or even 4.8% next year. That's what's hurting the market here. Um, I don't think the CME group updates that data quite as quickly as we'd like it them to. Probably takes them a little bit to do that. Um, so we're probably quicker by looking at the original uh, sources. So that's really the, the staggering number that's coming out of this. And if you want to look at the stock market broadly, um, well, no one's really, really noticed yet. I think I think the stock market is broadly half asleep. Um, if you look at this little chart down here, that's the SPX. Uh, that was trading at 3,885 before the announcement. Now it's trading at 3,834. So we lost about 50 points there. Um, and that's significant. Let's have a look at the QQQ as well. And that looks very, very similar. So we're down about 0.8% on the QQQ now. Which, which makes a heck of a lot of sense because it hits, it hits growth harder. And if you want to understand how that works, I put a video out on that yesterday, actually explaining precisely how that works and why it works the way it works. Um, and, and it's two, two factors, really. One is treasury yields. So the kind of risk-free investment that you can make by, um, you know what happened? Someone's moved my lumps. I think that's what happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, the risk-free alternative investment to stocks, U.S. treasuries, assuming that the U.S. government isn't going to default, um, if they pay you more, the value you put on stocks is lower. Why? Because the risk-free investment's gone up, right? Uh, and, and secondly, we also have to discount more sharply the future earnings based on higher inflation um, from, of companies. And that's how we generally value growth companies. On we, we look at their future earnings. We look at well, how much money are they making in 10 years? What's the money that they're making in 10 years worth today? So you have to kind of work out an inverse inverse inflation sort of calculation there. Let me see if there are any questions here. Um, I, uh, I, this is what we do at live, so you can ask questions. Just type it in the chat. It's free. You just got to subscribe to, be, to get into the chat, I think. Um, why are Chinese stocks tanking? I think saber wrestling. Is that the word? Saber wrestling? Saber, saber rattling. That's the word, isn't it? Um, between the US and China. I think that's kind of what it's about. Do you think even 5% will go from 8 to 2% inflation, says Keitha? Well, it really depends on how much of the commodity part of the inflation story sticks around and uh, how much of the, um, the story is about, you know, supply chain bottlenecks and so on. Like I showed you this chart this morning 
which shows you, for example, that the price of a um, 40 foot container, box container, it went up to $12,000, more than $12,000 in, in 2021. Now it's back to 4,200. So if that goes back to where it used to be at, at just under $2,000, then that obviously removes a lot of inflation because everything that arrives in the US pretty much comes in a box container. And um, I can tell you those rates have really gone up because I have businesses that ship a lot of box containers. And, and, and yeah, freight rates have dramatically increased. So that's just one thing. Same with van rates, the trucking rates. Uh, they were, um, you know, whatever they were here. And, and now they're down 50% less and, and so on. And you see the same thing with rentals and a lot of things that have come down. So if that continues and that then feeds into inflation data, we might actually end up with significantly a lower inflation. And that won't really be the Fed's achievement, although, of course, they'll take credit for it. And that's what people do. Uh, it'll, it'll actually just be the economy, the kind of world fixing supply chain problems i think that'll that'll be that's really the solution to this um everyone's still voting on the poll <laughs> yeah if you don't know what, what what's happened yet 75 percent points is what we got will you be selling into the close to take advantage of volatility or wait for tomorrow pete i'll wait for tomorrow and, and my my reason for that is that um, the market tends to not fully interpret this data on the day it comes out. I find, I find that the um, yeah the market is a little asleep when it comes out. They don't read it as quickly as we do, and therefore it, the, the real impact typically kicks in about uh, 24 hours later or, or thereabouts. So at the moment, a QQQ down 0.9 percent here. In a nutshell, uh, abysmality says JP is going to tank the market in 15 minutes. Well. You know, if he says exactly what he said at the last one, then no. But he is going to get pummeled on this shocker of a 4.625% interest rate in 2023. That's really what we want. That's what we want the uh, the journos in the room to ask about. Uh, and that's really what's going to matter here. Like, what is he going to say about that? Container prices are influenced by the new market of making tiny homes. You mean those container homes that people are making in Ch in China and that sort of thing? I don't think that's a big factor. I think it's it's um, supply chain issues. COVID was a massive disruption, uh, and then fuel costs, of course, but also just collusion. I mean, just uh, plain old uh, monopolies or duopolies, oligopolies uh, taking taking the Mickey. Really, um, the, the 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 whole container business is 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 is. Yeah, you know, three people running it, basically. Are solar ETFs going to get hit if oil goes lower? Likely. Yes, likely. Um, popular in the US? I know they are getting much more popular, and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but I, I, I don't think that's having... I think the container freight rates are not really so much a factor of the cost of container manufacturing, but much more a factor of the cost of moving them about, I think, or how much we're being charged by the, the shipping lines. I think that's really what this is all about. Um, I appreciate it. Um, no, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I appreciate your, your, your point of view, uh, Jay, as, as always. Uh, I'm just giving you my, my point of view. At least that's what my, my logistics guys are telling me. My, my ops guy keeps telling me that. And I, I believe it because I've spoken to quite a few forwarders my, myself on that story. Um, uh, is there a container shortage? I think there is a shortage of containers in the right place. <laughs> I think I think that's, again, a little bit more like it. So, you know, the containers are there, but they might be in the wrong country. And there isn't cargo to ship it back and that sort of thing. So uh, when China used to import a ton of cargo, uh, they would then re-export it. And there was sort of a relatively equal flow. If you haven't got the import demand, for example, then the export rates are going to be much more expensive because you're going to have to pay repositioning fees to get containers from Singapore or the west coast of the US or something to China empty. And that's, of course, expensive, which is the opposite of what used to happen. We used to get very, very low freight from Europe to China because we basically were filling empty containers. So we paid like we paid less to ship from Europe to China by sea than we paid to truck the containers to the port. That's how cheap rates used to be. So that was also an, an, an anomaly. Um, Mike, they appreciate it.
Andrea, you bought some containers. Yeah, you can pick them up. Secondhand containers are, are actually pretty affordable. They're not, they're not very expensive at all. Uh, let me just see if I can hook us up in preparation for this live stream. Yep, absolutely. So let me just get that set up for everybody here. Share screen. There it is. Um, let me make that a little bit wider. And then, okay, now we're a little bit small. I think we can probably do with a fed that's a little bit smaller than that. And I'll shift myself around a little bit. There I am. Um, and then we can probably do without Bloomberg yabbering on in a second as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep open some stock charts so you can see what the actual reaction is uh, from the market because I think that's really, really important uh, to, to see. So we literally are live here in a couple of minutes. Let me just make sure you've got sound. Can you hear that music? The loveliness of uh, call waiting music. I think you can, but I've just I've just turned it off for you on, intentionally. So, Robert says sound advice this morning to close iffy options. Most appreciated. Um, CVX and Xom tanked. Yeah, I, I I think that's always a good move, Robert. It's just like I can't remember who said said that to me the other day, but somebody said to me um, as an options trader, sail around the storms. Uh, or don't sail when it's stormy. And I know you're a sailor, Robert, so I think it might might resonate with you. Um, you. You know, you don't go out when it's the beginning of a thunderstorm. You go and uh, go to the bar and get yourself a drink. And I think we can do very, very much the same thing uh, with with our options. Of course, you can't do that as a stock in a long-term investor, which I think is still a good idea, but yeah. Um, you hear it, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so we literally got eight minutes here left before the Fed is going to, um, well, Jay Powell is going to go live. Um, so I want to encourage you to do one thing. One thing is turn the light down behind me because I'm not so backlit. Why am I so backlit today? I don't know why. Anyway, not much I can do about that at this point. So um, Goldman's top 26 stocks is a benchmark. It's free. It gives you access to exactly this list here. Let me show it to you. There it is. And um, it's 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 going to give you 26 stocks that Goldman's loves. So download it, futurefriends.org slash top26. It's completely free. As always, um, for those of you who have an interest to learn more about education and, and, and about the market, generally speaking, um, we do have a, a, a program out on that. I know a lot of you guys are, are part of. Um, if you have at least a five-figure portfolio, uh, check it out. There is a coaching program, which I run with my, my coaching team. Really, really, we're talking university lecturers, uh, people who've been trading options for 20 years for investment banks and so on. That's who you learn from. So check it out. Uh, here's the link, felixfenster.org slash coaching. Uh, if you have any questions on that, ping me a message. Uh, my, my emails and everything is always in every video. Um, I, I love hearing from you and I'll definitely reply to you. Um, now, any last questions before uh, this really, really kicks off here? Because that's what's about to happen. Is Serious stuff is about to happen. The future's bright. The future's orange juice, says Danzo, is it? Actually, what are the futures doing? Let me have a look at that. I can see some of you guys jumping on that um, Goldman's thing. The futures are looking rather red. Um, even orange juice is down. Yeah, the whole market is down between sort of 0.7 to 0.85%. I would expect volatility is up 1.6%. That's what I was expecting it to be. So tomorrow might be a really nice time to sell some options um, for everybody in the options community. The dollar is up. Another 1.1%, crikey, that really is, is, is quite something. It's almost, well, it's not the interest rate decision, right? We all knew that was coming. That really isn't it at all. What it is, is this here. This is the dot plot. This is how the Fed presidents have voted, where they see the interest rates going in 2023. So end of the year, 4.25%. We knew that. That's done. That's priced in. No one cares. But next year, 4.625% with a third of that lot at 4.875%. And that's that would be very, very painful for the market. And that would just give us a continued unpleasant market um, for much, much longer than, than we would like. 
Robert, what is the what's this about, Robert? Airspeed velocity of an African sparrow laden with. Do you think an African sparrow can carry a coconut? I very much doubt it. Um, Jay Powell needs to do a shout out for KWEW, KWEB, which is the Chinese um, tech ETF. Yeah, absolutely. He needs that. How are mortgage rates calculated? Um, yeah, I think, I don't know if they're Fed fund rates or LIBOR rates or HIBOR rates or depending on, on where you live in the world. Uh, but yeah, obviously this is a factor into that. So you get an extra percentage point into this. You get an extra percentage point on your, your mortgages if they are flexible. Um, a shrubbery. Let me see if I missed any questions here. Okay, I'm glad you guys are, are jumping, uh, having a bit of a bit of a joke here. Uh, Mr. Luigi, I appreciate you saying to hit the like button. I truly appreciate that. We've got about a thousand people on here. Uh, so we're missing, I think, quite quite a few likes. Uh, it's free, burns a calorie, and it might even, you know, help somehow move the market up. Imagine if every like moved the market up by a cent or something. That'd be tremendous, wouldn't it? So do smash that button. Um, Monty Python reference. Okay, I, I I love Monty Python, Robert, but I I I don't don't know that one, uh, but that is a good one. Um, keep it up, Big E. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, you should get a light dimmer. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think. Well, I, I think really what I need to do, I need to put the lights back up in front of me, and I haven't I haven't done that. And for some reason, when I go bigger, it seems to go a little bit brighter. Where does it want me to be? Yeah, I see, see over here, it's brighter. Can you see that? Very sensitive camera. Um, yeah, all right, but there we are. Uh, subbed, I much appreciate that, Chris. I truly appreciate that. Dislike for shorts, uh, then coughing. <laughs> um, traditionally, mortgage rates tend to follow the 10-year treasury. Uh, very true, Michael. Uh, I think that's, a, that's some, some, some wise words there. So Fed's going to speak in like four minutes. In fact, let's have a look at the 10-year the, the and the two-year and so on. Uh, where are they? This is the two year. It's at 4.078%. You can't see that. Let me share that with you. There it is. It's at 4.078%. And you can see that going up today, right? Really significantly, 2.75%. The US 10 year is, oh, that's the wrong one. If you want the yield, uh, it's at 3.568% exceeding the June highs. Um, and I've got the S&P in orange on here, which shows you the kind of inverse relationship. So the higher this goes, the lower that goes. And notably, it was up more today. It went all the way to 3.64, and now it's come down again a bit. It's actually hasn't gone up at all today, which is interesting. Um, so the yield curve inversion is very, 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 very much alive. Um, the two-year being significantly higher at over 4% than the, than the two-year. And, and that's, I mean, the two-year moves much, much more like a US, uh, where is it? Zero to, there it is, uh, at 4.078%. Yeah, coming down a touch actually, which is which is nice to see, but still up to 2.75 percentage points today on the whopping shocker uh, that we the Fed sees interest rates going to 4.675% next year, possibly a little higher. <laughs> you think Jerome Powell is watching? Uh, I, I hope so. And I hope he hits the like button. I mean, otherwise, or, you know, he's, he's out, isn't he? Uh, we don't want him here in that case. Um, yeah, the US 1 to 3, 30 year also widely inverted. You're quite right. The 5 to 30, I think, is also inverted. Massive inversion, which basically just means alarm bells ringing for a recession. Um, the shock is you don't have dark theme on your YouTube. Is it, Danzo? I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the charts. I've come around to it, but I'm not a big fan of it. I quite like the brightness on the charts. I think it's quite nice. But I still like everything else to be kind of bright. So this down here is the QQQ, which is um, you can't really see. It's cut off, isn't it now? For you guys, but you can you can see it that way. That way you can see it. So why why am I dividing the screen like this? Because in a moment we'll be able to write some notes here, and I think that's quite useful. So I'll zip it uh, while we're listening to to Jay Powell, and um, I've been interrupted, but I'll, I'll give you my perspective and my notes. 
uh, from a you know former economist, former banker, and so on, give you my perspective on what what he's saying compared to uh, what he has been saying. And I think that's really important and how that affects market to give you a bit of color, which I hope will be useful for everybody. Um, one minute to go, indeed. Papa Powell about to speak, indeed. He is going to give a statement first and then Q&A. It's the Q&A that I live for. If you do too, smash the like button. Uh, and think it's a, it's a head fake to let the market do its bidding. Could be. I mean, the Fed basically lives by expectations. That's what it's all about. Um, hope he's warm and fuzzy like Winston. Yeah, Winston is lovely. Really. I was just driving around with Winston on my passenger seat and people keep like staring and pointing. It's very sweet. Um, everyone get behind the shed. Indeed. Dig a hole. Go for cover. Here we go. It's very silent, isn't it? The suspense. Here we go. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve and serves as the bedrock of our economy. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Today, the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point, and we anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. We are moving our policy stance purposefully to a level that will be sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2%. In addition, we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. I will have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. The U.S. economy has slowed from the historically high growth rates of 2021, which reflected the reopening of the economy following the pandemic recession. Recent indicators point to modest growth of spending and production. Growth in consumer spending has slowed from last year's rapid pace, in part reflecting lower real disposable income and tighter financial conditions. Activity in the housing sector, sector has weakened significantly, in large part reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment, while weaker economic growth abroad is restraining exports. As shown in our summary of economic projections, since June, FOMC participants have marked down their projections for economic activity, with the median projection for real GDP growth standing at just 0.2% this year and 1.2% next year, well below the median estimate of the longer run normal growth rate. Despite the slowdown in growth, the labor market has remained extremely tight with the unemployment rate near a 50 year low, job vacancies near historical highs, and wage growth elevated. Job gains have been robust, with employee employment rising by an average of 378,000 jobs per month over the last three months. The labor market continues to be out of balance, with demand for workers substantially exceeding the supply of available workers. The labor force participation rate showed a welcome uptick in August, but has little changed since the beginning of the year. FOMC participants expect supply and demand conditions in the labor market to come into better balance over time, easing the upward pressure on wages and prices. The median projection in the SEP for the unemployment rate rises to 4.4% at the end of next year, a half percentage point higher than in the June projections. Over the next three years, the median unemployment rate runs above the median estimate of its longer run normal level. Inflation remains well above our 2% longer run goal. Over the 12 months ending in July, <clears throat> total PCE prices rose 6.3%, excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 4.6%. In August, the 12 month change in, consumer, in the consumer price index was 8.3% and the change in the core CPI was 6.3%. Price pressures remain evident across a broad range of goods and services. Although gasoline prices have turned down in recent months, they remain well above year earlier levels, 
in part reflecting Russia's war against Ukraine, which has boosted prices for energy and food and has created additional upward pressure on inflation. The median projection in the SEP for total PCE inflation is 5.4% this year and falls to 2.8% next year, 2.3% in 2024, and 2% in 2025. Participants continue to see risks to inflation as weighted to the upside. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term deflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. But that is not grounds for complacency. The longer the current bout of, bout of high inflation continues, the greater the chance that expectations of higher inflation will become entrenched. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by three quarters of a percentage point, bringing the target range to three to three and a quarter percent. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet, which plays an important role in firming the stance of monetary policy. Over coming months, we will be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is moving down, consistent with inflation returning to 2%. We anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate. The pace of those increases will continue to depend on the incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. With today's action, we have raised interest rates by three percentage points this year. At some point, as the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases while we assess how our cumulative policy adjustments are affecting the economy and inflation. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting and communicate our thinking as clearly as possible. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. As shown in the SEP, the median projection for the appropriate level of the federal funds rate is 4.4% at the end of this year, one percentage point higher than projected in June. The median projection rises to 4.6% at the end of next year and declines to 2.9% by the end of 2025, still above the median estimate of its longer run value. Of course, these projections do not represent a committee decision or plan, and no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or more from now. We are taking forceful and rapid steps to moderate demand so that it comes into better alignment with supply. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a sustained period of below trend growth, and there will very likely be some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to, set, to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. We will keep at it until we're confident the job is done. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country, Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you for taking our questions. Gina Smiley from the New York Times. I wonder if you could give us a little detail around how you'll know when to slow down these rate increases and how you'll eventually know when to stop. So I will, answer your, I will answer your question directly, but I want to start uh, here today by saying that my main message has not changed at all since Jackson Hole. Uh, the FOMC is strongly resolved to bring inflation down to 2%, and we will keep at it until the job is done. So um, the way we're thinking about this is um, 
the overarching fo focus of the committee is getting inflation back down to 2%. Uh, to accomplish that, we think we'll need to do two things in particular uh, to achieve a period of growth below trend and also some softening in labor market conditions to foster a better balance between demand and supply in the labor market. So on the first, uh, uh, committee's forecasts and those of most outside forecasters do show growth running below its longer run potential this year and next year. On the second though, so far there's only modest evidence that the labor market is cooling off. Job openings are down a bit. Uh, as you know, quits are off their all time highs. There's some signs that some wage measures may be flattening out, but not moving up. Payroll gains have moderated, but not much. And in light of the um, uh, high inflation we're seeing, we think we'll need to, and in light of what, what I just said, we, we think that we'll need to bring uh, our, our funds rate to a restrictive level and to keep it there for some time. So um, what will we be looking at, I guess, is your question. So we'll be looking at a few things. First, we'll want to see growth continuing to run below trend. We'll want to see movements in the labor market showing a return to a better balance between supply and demand. And ultimately, we'll want to see clear evidence that inflation is moving back down uh, to, to 2%. So that's what we'll be looking for. Um, in terms of um, of reducing rates, I think we'd, we'd want to be very confident that inflation is moving back down uh, to 2% to two before we would consider that. Steve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Leisman, CNBC. Can you talk about how you factor in uh, the variable lags on inflation and the extent to which um, the outlook for rates should be seen as linear in the sense that you keep raising rates? Or can you envision a time when there's a pause to uh, kind of look at what has been wrought in the economy from the rate increases? Thank you. Sure. So, um, of course, monetary policy does does famously work with long and variable lags. Uh, the way I think of it is our, our policy decisions affect financial conditions immediately. In fact, financial conditions have usually been affected well before we actually announce our decisions. Then changes in financial conditions begin to affect uh, act economic activity fairly quickly within a few months. But it's likely to take some time um, uh, to see the full full effects of changing financial conditions on inflation. So we are we are very much mindful for that. And that's why I noted in my in my opening remarks that at some point, as the stance of policy tightens further, it will become appropriate to slow the pace of rate hikes while we assess how our cumulative policy adjustments are affecting the economy and inflation. So that's how we think about that. Your second question, sorry, was. Is there a point in time you can see pausing? Is it linear that you keep raising rates or is there? Oh, I'm sorry. I should know better than to not talk with my microphone. Um, I, I should know better than to answer your second question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, is it linear? Do you keep raising rates or is there a pause that you could envision where you kind of figure out uh, what what has happened to the economy and give uh, time to catch up uh, in the real economy, the, the rate increase time to catch up in the real economy? Thank you. So so I think I think it's it's very hard to say with the precise certainty the way this is going to unfold. As I mentioned, what we think we need to do and should do is to move our policy rate to a restrictive level that's restrictive enough to bring inflation down to 2%, where we have confidence of that. And what you see in the SEP numbers is people's views as of as of today, as of this meeting, as to the, the kind of levels that will be appropriate. Now, those 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 will those will evolve over time. And I think we'll we'll um, we'll just have to, to see how that goes. I, I, th there is a possibility, certainly, that we would go to go to a certain level that we are confident in and and stay there for a time. Um, but we're not at that level. Clearly today, we're, you know, we're just, uh, we, we've just moved, I think, probably into the very, the very lowest level of what might be restrictive. And, and certainly in my view and in the view of the committee, there's, uh, there's uh, a ways to go. Hey, Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from the Washington Post. Thank you for taking our questions. The projections show the unemployment rate rising to 4.4% next year. And historically, th that kind of rise in the unemployment rate would typically bring a recession with it. Should we interpret that to mean no soft landing? And is that kind of rise necessary to get inflation down? Right. So um, so 
You're right. In in the in the SEP, there is a what I would characterize as a relatively modest increase in the unemployment rate from a historical perspective, given the expected de to decline in inflation. Now, why is that? So, really, it is that is um, what we generally expect, uh, because we see the current situation as um, outside of historical ex experience in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of those first. And you know these, but first, job openings are incredibly high relative to the number of people looking for work. Uh, it's plausible, I'll say, that job openings could come down significantly, and they, they need to, without as much of an increase in unemployment as has happened in earlier historical episodes. So that's one thing. In addition, in this cycle, uh, longer run inflation expectations are have generally been fairly well anchored. Uh, I, and I've, as I've said, there's no, no basis for complacency there. But to the extent that uh, continues to be the case, that should make it easier to restore price stability. And I guess the, th the third thing I would point to that's different this time is that part of this inflation is caused by this series of supply shocks that we've had, beginning with the pandemic and really with, really with the reopening of the economy, and more recently amplified and added to by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, have all contributed to the sharp increase in inflation. So these are, these are the kinds of events that are not really seen in, in prior business cycles. And in principle, if those things uh, start to get better, and we do see some evidence of the beginnings of that, uh, it's not much more than that, but it's, it's good to see that. Um, for example, commodity prices look like they may have peaked for now. Supply chain disruptions are beginning to resolve. Those developments, if sustained, could help ease the pressures on inflation. So let me just say how much these factors uh, will turn out to really matter in, in, this, in this sequence of events, it remains to be seen. We have always understood that restoring price stability while achieving a relatively modest decline, a rather increase in unemployment and a soft landing would be would be very challenging. And, and we don't know. No one knows whether this process will lead to a recession or if so, how significant that recession would be. That's going to depend on uh, how quickly wage and price inflation, inflation pressures come down, whether expectations remain anchored uh, and whether you know, also do we get more labor supply, which would help as well. In addition, the chances of a soft landing, landing are likely to diminish to the extent that policy needs to be more restrictive or restrictive for longer. Nonetheless, uh, we're committed to getting inflation back down to 2% because we think that a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain later on. Are vacancies still at the top of your list in terms of understanding the labor market and how much room there is there? Yes, vacancies are still almost two to one uh, ratio to unemployed people. That's a that and quits are, are really very good ways to look at how tight the labor market is and how different it is from other cycles, where uh, which where the generally the unemployment rate itself is the, is the single best indicator. We think those things have for a, quite a time now uh, really added value in terms of understanding where the labor market is. Nick. Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you said not too long ago uh, in describing the, the policy destination, there's still a way to go. But I, I imagine you have to have some idea about how you're thinking about your destination, whether it's a stopping point or a pausing point. And so I was wondering if you could uh, discuss how you are thinking about, uh, as the data come in, where that destination is, how it's moving up if inflation doesn't perform uh, as you expect. Do you want to have a policy rate that's above uh, the underlying inflation rate, for example? And do you have an estimate for where you think the underlying inflation rate might be in the economy right now? Well, so again, we we believe that we need to raise our policy stance overall to a level that is restrictive. And by that, I mean is is um, meaningfully put, putting mean, meaningful downward pressure on inflation. That's what we that's what we need to see in in the stance of policy. We also know that there are, are long and variable lags, particularly as they relate to inflation. So it, it's a challenging assessment. So what do you look at? You look at broader financial conditions, as you know, are you look you look at where rates are real and nominal. In some cases, you look at credit spreads, you look at at, at uh, financial conditions indexes. We also I would think uh, and you see this in the this is something we talked about today in the meeting and talk about in all of our meetings. And you see this, I think, in, in the committee forecast. You want to be at a place where 
real rates are positive across the entire yield curve. And I, I think that would be the case if you look at the, the numbers that we're, that we're writing down and think about, um, uh, you measure those against uh, some sort of forward-looking assessment of inflation, inflation expectations. I think you would see at, at that time, you'd see positive real rates across the, which, across the yield curve. And that, that is also an important consideration. Uh, hi, uh, uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Thanks for um, uh, the opportunity. I, I just want to be clear on the on, on the steps. Um, you say it's meeting by meeting, but it sure looks like we're going 75, 50, 25. Um, is 75 uh, next month the baseline? So uh, we, we make uh, one decision per meeting, and the meeting decision we made today was to raise the federal funds rate by, by 75. Um, you're right that a uh, uh, you know a uh, the median for uh, for the year end suggests another 125 basis points in rate increases, um, but there's also there's a you know there's another fairly large group that that saw 100 basis points addition to where we are today, so that would be 25 basis points less. So you know we're going to make that decision at the meeting. We had we didn't make that decision today. We didn't vote on that. Um, I would say that you know we're committed to getting to a restrictive level of um, uh, for the federal funds rate and getting there pretty quickly, and uh, that's what we're thinking about. So, just as, as a follow-up to that, I'm wondering about the sort of risk management considerations here. Given there's some discussion now of of overdoing it, what's the incentive to continue front-loading right now? Um, is it a lack of progress on inflation seen in the CPI reports? Or is it a, a motivation to get as much done while the uh, job market is still as strong as it is? So what, what we've seen is um, inflation has, we, our expectation has been that we would begin to see inflation come down, largely because of, of supply side uh, healing. By now, we would have thought to, that we would have seen some of that. We haven't. We have seen some supply side healing, but inflation has not really come down. If you look at, at core PCE inflation, which is you know, a good measure of where inflation is running now, uh, if you look at it on a three, six, and 12-month trailing annualized basis, you'll see that that inflation is at 4.8%, 4.5%, and 4.8%. So that's a, those, that's a pretty good summary of where we are with inflation. And that's not where we expected or wanted to be. So what that tells us is that we, we need to continue, and we, and we can keep doing these, uh, and, and we did today do another large increase as we approach the level that we think we need to get to, and we're still discovering what that level is. But people are writing that down in their SEP uh, where they think policy needs to be. So that that's how that's how we're thinking about it. Let's go to Colby. Thank you, Colby Smith of the Financial Times. Uh, Chair Paul, how should we interpret the fact that core inflation is still not forecast in the SEP to be back uh, to target in 2025? And yet the dot plot projects cuts as early as 2024. And does that mean there's a level of inflation um, above the 2% target that the Fed is willing to tolerate? So I guess core is at 2.1 in 2025 and in the median and, and, and headline is at 2.0. So that's pretty close. I mean, we, we write down our forecasts and we, we, figure out what the median is and we publish it. So it's not, um, I mean, I, I would say that if, you know, if, if, if the, actually if the economy followed this path, this would be a pretty good outcome, but you're right. It is a 10th higher than 2%. Okay. Just as a quick follow-up. I mean, if the concern is that underlying inflation is becoming more entrenched perhaps each month, then why forego the more aggressive hundred basis point increase today? And does that risk having to do more later on? Yeah. So we, um, as we as we said, you know, at the last press conference and in between that one and this one, we said that uh, we would make our decision based on the overall data coming in. So if you remember, we we got a we got a surprisingly low reading in July, and then a surprising high surprisingly high re reading for August. So I think you have to you, you can't really you never want to overreact too much to any one data point. So if you look if you look at them together, and as I just mentioned, if you really really look at this year's inflation, three six and twelve month trailing, you see. Inflation is running too high. It's running 4.5% or above. You don't need to know much more than that. If that's the one thing you know, you know that, that this committee is committed to getting to a you know, meaningfully restrictive stance of policy 
and staying there until until we feel confident that inflation is coming down. So that's how we that's how we think about it. Um, hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. I wanted to ask about um, the balance sheet. You all have left open the possibility that you might sell mortgage-backed securities, but we've seen significant slowing in the housing market. Mortgage rates have gone up significantly, and I'm just wondering whether conditions there uh, might affect your plans for, for how quickly you have the runoff on the MBS side. So we, what we said, as you know, was that um, we would consider that uh, once balance sheet uh, runoff is well underway. I would say it's not something we're considering right now and not something I expect to be considering uh, in the near term. It's just, uh, it's something I think we will turn to, but that time, the time for turning to it, it has not come and is not close. Well, and will, will conditions in the housing market affect that decision? I think a number of things might affect that decision. But the main thing is we're not considering that decision and I don't expect that we will anytime soon. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, Neil Irwin with Axios. Um, a number of commentators have uh, come to the view, and uh, including over at the World Bank, that simultaneous global tightening around the world is uh, creates a risk of a global recession that's worse than is necessary to bring inflation down. Uh, how do you see that risk? Uh, how do you think of coordination with your fellow central bankers? Uh, and uh, is there is there much risk of, of overdoing it on a global level? Um, so we, we um, actually, my colleagues and I, a number of my FOMC colleagues and I just got back from a, one of our frequent trips to uh, Basel, Switzerland, to meet with other senior central bank officials from around the world. We are in pretty regular contact and we exchange, of course, we all serve a domestic mandate, domestic objectives, in our case, the dual mandate, maximum employment and price stability. But we regularly discuss uh, uh, what we're seeing in terms of our own economy and international spillovers. And it's, it's a very ongoing, constant kind of a process. So um, we are very aware of what's going on in, in other economies around the world and what that means for us and vice versa. Our, the forecast that we, that we put together, that our staff puts together and that we put together on our own, always take all of that, try to take all of that into account. I mean, I can't say that we do it perfectly, but it's not, it's not as if we don't think about you know, the, the policy decisions, monetary policy and otherwise, the economic developments that are taking place in major economies that can have an effect on the U.S. economy. That is very much baked into our our own forecast and our own understanding of, of you know, of the U.S. economy as best we can. It won't be perfect. So, you know, I, I don't see it, 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 it's hard to talk about collaboration in a world where people have very different uh, levels of interest rates. If you remember, there were coordinated cuts and raises and things like that at various times. And but really, really, we're all we're in very different situations. But I, I will tell you that our, our, our contact is more or less ongoing and it's not coordination, but there's a lot of information sharing. And we all, I think, are informed by what by what other important economies and economies that are important to the United States are doing. Craig Torres from Bloomberg. Uh, Chair Powell, you talked about some ways the um, higher interest rates are affecting the economy, but we've also seen a resilient labor market with durable consumption, uh, strong corporate profits. And I'm wondering what your story is on the resilience of the economy. After all, you and your colleagues said, well, we started tightening in March when we were talking about interest rates in the future, and indeed, Treasury rates moved up, so we should have had a lot of tightening um, taking effect. Why is the economy, in your view, so resilient? And does it mean that we might need a possibly higher terminal rate? You're, you're right. Of course, the labor market, in particular, has been has been very strong. Um, but there are the you know the the sectors of the economy that are uh, most interest rate sensitive are sensitive are certainly. Uh, showing the effects of our tightening and of course the obvious example is housing where you see de de declining activity uh, and of all different kinds and and ha housing price increases moving down so we're having an effect on um on interest sensitive spending uh i think through through exchange rates we're having an effect on on uh, exports and imports uh, i think um so all of that's happening but you're right. It's a, and we we've, we've we've said this. You know, this is a this is a strong, robust economy. Um, people have savings on their balance sheet. 
uh, from the period when they couldn't spend and where they were getting government transfers. There's still very significant savings out there, although not as much at the, at the lower end of the income spectrum, but still some savings out there to support growth. The, 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 the states are very flush with cash. So there's a good reason to think that this, this will continue to be a reasonably strong economy. Now, the data, the data sort of are, are showing that growth is, is, is going to be below trend this year. We think of trend as being about 1.8% in, or in that range. Um, we, we were forecasting growth well below that, and most forecasters are. But you're right. There is a, there's, there's certainly a possibility that, that, that growth can be stronger than that. And you know that's a good thing because because that means the economy will be more resistant to uh, you know to a significant downturn, um, w w you know. But of course, we are focused on the thing I started with, it, which is getting inflation back down to two percent. Um, we we can't fail to do that. If we, I mean, that's uh, if we were to fail to do that, that would be the thing that would be most painful for the people that we serve. So for now, that has to be our 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 overarching focus. And you see that, I think, in the uh, in the SEP, in, in the levels of rates that we'll be moving to reasonably quickly, uh, assuming things turn out roughly in line with the SEP. So that's how we think about it. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a uh, world of euphemisms that we live in here with uh, below trend growth and a modest increase in unemployment, I'm wondering if I could ask you a couple of direct questions for the American people. Uh, do the odds now favor, given where you are and where you're going with interest rates, favor a recession? 4.4% um, unemployment is about 1.3 million jobs. Is that acceptable job loss? And then given that the data you look at is backward looking and the lags in your policy are forward looking and you don't know what they are. How will you know or will you know if you've gone too far? So I, I don't um, I don't know what the odds are. I think that that there's a very high likelihood that we'll have uh, a period of what I've mentioned is below trend growth, by which I mean much lower growth. And we're seeing that now. So the median forecast, I think, this year for uh, among my colleagues and, and me was 0.2 percent growth. So that's that's very slow growth. And and then below trend next year, I think the median was 1.2, also well below. So that's a slower. Uh, that's a that's a very slow level of growth, and it could give rise to increases in unemployment. But I think that's so that is something that that we think we need to have. And we think we need to have softer labor market conditions as well. Um, you know, we're never going to say that there are that there are too many people working. But the, the real point is this um, inflation. What we hear from people when we meet with them is that that they really are suffering from inflation. And if we want to set ourselves up, really, really light the way to another period of a very strong labor market, we have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a, a painless way to do that. There isn't. So what we need to do is get rates up to, to the point where we're play, putting meaningful downward pressure on inflation. And that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And um, we, we don't, certainly don't, don't hope, we, we, we certainly haven't given up the idea that we can have a relatively modest increase in, in unemployment. Nonetheless, we need to complete this task. Well, how will you know, or will you know, if you've gone too far? It's hard to, hard to hypothetically uh, deal with that question. I mean, our, again, our, our, our really tight focus now continues to be ongoing rate increases to get the policy rate up, up where it needs to be. And, and as I said, you can look at, the, look at this SEP as today's estimate of where we think those rates would be. Of course, they will evolve over time. I wanted to follow up with what you uh, just mentioned about the labor market. You've said several times that to have the labor market we want, we need price stability. Uh, and you've suggested maybe there isn't a trade off in the long run. But in the short run, there is a lot of concern, as people have been expressing here, about higher unemployment as a result of these uh, rate hikes or as a result of rate hikes. So, can you explain, though, uh, what about high inflation now? threatens the job market. I mean, you seem to suggest that inflation, um, high inflation will, you know, will eventually lead to a weaker job market. So can you spell that out a little more for the general public and how that would work? So for starters, people are seeing their wage increases, their, their 
wage increases eaten up by inflation. So if, you're, if you, your family is one where you spend most of your paycheck, every paycheck cycle on gas, food, transportation, clothing, basics of life, and prices go up the way they've been going up, you're in trouble right away. You, you don't have a cushion. And this is very painful for people at the lower end of the income and wealth spectrum. So that's what we're hearing from people is, you know, it, it very much that inflation is, is really hurting. So how do we get rid of inflation? And, and as, as I mentioned, it would be nice if there were, you know, a way to just wish it away, but there isn't. Um, we have to get supply and demand back into alignment. And the way we do that is by slowing the economy. Hopefully we do that by slowing the economy and we see a, some softening in labor market conditions and we see uh, a big contribution from supply side uh, you know, improvements and things like that, but none of that is guaranteed. Um, in any case, we our job is to deliver price stability. And I think you can think of price stability as an asset that just delivers large benefits to society over a long period of time. We really saw that for a long time. The United States had 2% inflation, didn't move around much, and that was enormously beneficial to the public that we that we serve. And we have to get back to that and 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 keep it for a, another long period of time. To to pull back from the task of doing that is you're just you're just postponing. The record shows that if you postpone that, that delay is only likely to lead to more pain. So um, you know, I think we're we're moving to to do what we need to do and do our jobs and and uh, and that's what you see us doing. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Edward Lawrence for Fox Business. Um, so you had said that Americans and businesses need to feel some economic pain as we go forward. How long from here should Americans be prepared for that economic pain? How long? I mean, it, it, it really depends on how long it takes for wages and, and more than that, prices to, to come down, for, for inflation to come down. And you, you, so you, what you see in our, in our projections today is that uh, inflation moves down, uh, you know, significantly over the course of next year, and then more the next year after that. And, you know, I think I think um, once you're on that path, that's that's a good thing. And things will start to feel better to people. They'll feel lower inflation. They'll feel the economy's improving. And also, if our if our projections are are close to right, you'll see, you will see that, you know, that the costs in unemployment are they're meaningful and they're certainly very meaningful to the people who lose their jobs. And we talk about that in our meetings um, quite a lot. But um, at the same time, we'd be setting the economy up for another long period. This, this era has been noted for very long expansions. We've had three of the four longest in measured history since we got inflation under control. And that's, that's not an accident. So when inflation is low and stable, you can have these nine, 10, 11, 10 year, uh, anyway, uh, uh, expansions and that you saw you can see what we saw in 2018 19 and 20 which was very low unemployment the, the, the biggest wage gains going to people at the low end of the spectrum the smallest racial gaps that we've seen in, in, in since we started keeping track of that so we want to get back to that but to get there we we're going to have to get supply and demand back uh, in alignment and that's going to take tight uh, you know, tight monetary policy for a period of time. Period of time. As a follow, what what is that economic pain in your mind? Is it job losses? Is it of a higher interest rates on credit cards? What is that economic pain? So it's all of those things. You know, higher interest rates, slower growth, and a softening labor market are are all painful for the public that we serve. But they're not as painful as failing to to restore price stability, and then having to come back and do it. Uh, you know down the road again and, and doing the, at a time when actually now people have really come to expect uh you know in high inflation if 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 the if the concept of high inflation becomes entrenched in people's economic thinking about their decisions then then sort of getting back to price stability the cost the cost of getting back to price stability just rises and, and so we want to avoid that we want to we want to act aggressively now and get this job done and keep at it until it's done Thank you, Chairman Powell. Nicole Goodkind, CNN Business. Um, existing home sales have fallen for seven months straight. Mortgage rates are at their highest level since 2008. Um, yet mortgage demand increased this week and housing prices are still elevated. Now, at the end of your June press conference, you mentioned plans to reset the housing market. 
I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you mean when you say reset and uh, what you think it will take to actually get there. So we, when I say reset, I'm not looking at a particular specific, you know, set of data or anything. What I'm really saying is that we've we've had a we've had a time of of a red hot housing market all over the country, where you know famously houses were selling to the first buyer at 10 percent above the the ask before even seeing the house, that kind of thing. So um, there was a big imbalance between supply and demand. Housing prices were going up at an unsustainably fast level. So. The deceleration in housing prices that we're seeing should help bring sort of prices more closely in line with rents and other housing market fundamentals. Um, and, you know, that's a good thing. For the longer term, what we need is supply and demand to get better aligned so that housing prices go up at a reasonable level, uh, at a reasonable pace, and that uh, people can afford houses again. And I think we, so we probably in the housing market have to go through a correction to get back to that place. There's also there are also longer run issues though with the housing market as you know where where you know um, it's it's um, difficult to find lots now close close enough to cities and things like that so builders are having a hard time getting zoning and lots and workers and materials and things like that but from a sort of business cycle standpoint th this difficult correction should put the housing market back into better better balance. Shelter made up such a large part of this hot CPI report that we saw. Do you think that there is a lag and that we will see that come down in the coming months? Or do you think that there's still this imbalance that needs to be addressed? No, I, I think that shelter shelter inflation is going to remain high for some time. You know, we're looking for it to come down, but it's not exactly clear when that will happen. Um, uh, so it may take some time so I, I think that i think you know hope for the best plan for the worst so i, th I think on shelter inflation you've just got to assume that it's going to remain pretty high for a while okay we'll go to gene for the last question hi gene young with market news um you've talked about the need to get real rates into positive territory and you said earlier that policy is just moving into that territory now so i'm curious um how restrictive is rates at 4.6% expected is is that expected to be next year how restrictive sure. so i think if you look you know when we get to if we let's assume we do get to that level um which i think is likely uh you know you what you're going to do is you're going to adjust that for some forward measure looking measure of of uh of um of inflation and you know that could be you pick your measure it could be you know, there, there, there are all kinds of different things you could pick and you get, but what you'll get is a positive number. In all cases, you will get forward inflation expectations in the short term, I think, that are going to be, assuming that we're doing our jobs appropriately, that will be significant. That's so so you'll, you'll have a positive uh, federal funds rate at that point, by the, which could be 1% or so. But I mean, I don't know exactly what it would be, but it would be significantly positive when we get to that level. And let, let me say, you know, we, we've written down what we think is is a, a plausible path for the federal funds rate the path that we actually execute will be enough it will be enough to restore price stability so this is this is something that as you can see they've they've moved up and we're going to continue to watch incoming data and the evolving outlook and and ask ourselves where our whether our policy is in the right place as we go thank you very much
for that. Hi right, guys, Mike's muted. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I, I tend to do that, uh, but let me give you a quick, quick roundup for anybody who's still around. I'm a bit sleepy today, a bit of a scratchy throat. So apologies for the sluggishness here. Market is zigzagging like crazy on the, on the news here. They can't quite make up their, their mind whether this is good or bad news. I would say this is bad news because not only did we get the high rate hike we were in, in expecting, but we got the expectation of higher rates in 2023. And that's what this chart here shows is that we expect rates to go to 4.625% by 2023. And that's not what we were expecting. We were expecting 4.25% by the end of the year and, and basically fizzling off from there. That was what kind of the market expectation. So this is a different story. This is significantly higher rates hikes for longer. We're still going to get 1% to 1.25% rate hikes this year. There's only two more meetings left, November and December. So you're going to get another 75-point rate hike probably in November and then a half point in, um, in, uh, in, in December and then some more in, in the beginning of next year. So this isn't over yet. I can't see why the market is up, quite frankly, 0.75%. doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense, but the market often doesn't on these days. So I want to say a huge thank you to you guys for tuning in. It's really rare. Very few people watch these things live and really try to understand and hear it directly from the horse's mouth. And that's way, way better than uh, just, um, um, you know, reading a headline or two. Uh, Bloomberg hasn't quite caught up with it yet, but let's have a quick look at what the, the reaction is from um, Reuters and Bloomberg and Co. Because that's also important. How is it per trade? Ray, Reuters says Fed delivers big rate hike. He's another large increase this year. I think that's very accurate. And I can't see why the market will be up on that news. If we go to Bloomberg, what are those guys saying? Fed to hike in a moment? They haven't, they haven't updated yet. Oh, it'll be on the Asia edition. Maybe that's why. Let's go on the US edition. Is anyone awake yet at Bloomberg? Powell says rates to be raised purposefully to curb inflation, stocks whips, or slightly hawkish surprise. I think I think that's kind of the correct way of putting that. Uh, it is a bit of a, a hawkish surprise. So the market shouldn't be loving this. I wouldn't expect it to, but it hasn't moved all that much. You know, the stuff that's down, the Chinese stocks on sort of more US-Chinese um, geopolitical nonsense down significantly. But the kind of middle of the market, the stuff that matters, Amazon's down a third of a percent, Nike is flat, Apple is up a third, Netflix up almost half a percentage point, Microsoft up one percentage point. So that moves the market up, right? When the big boys move up, uh, Palantir up 5%, which is quite a nice surprise here. GameStop up 4%, which means some people think this is good news in, in the gaming quarter. Um, now, if you uh, want to figure out how you build that second income stream and, and take Powell's advice on if you're working for a salary, you're earning less now than you were two years ago. Seriously, it's miserable, isn't it? You're getting less paid per hour than you were like two years ago, thanks to inflation. All those uh, job, those pay increases you got have been dwarfed by inflation. How do you get around that? I used to be a corporate slave um, myself, uh, and I didn't particularly enjoy it. Uh, build extra income streams for it. Uh, we have a way of uh, doing that. We uh, we trade options, and we do it in a sensible way. We don't gamble. We don't uh, hope and pray and wish something's going to go up or down. We don't care, quite frankly. And how do we do that? Well, check out the... Um, Felix Rentsalog slash coaching if you have at least a five-figure portfolio and have a chat with us, watch the video, uh, review the materials over there. And if that piques your interest, we'd have a chat to see how we can help you there, how we get you there. We've got about 2,700 students so far in the community and you'll learn from me directly if you're on the coaching program as well as uh, proper seasoned traders. Um, we're just uh, uh, onboarding a new coach today who's been an investment banker for 20 years. I know Boohoo and all that, but he knows what he's doing. Um, and um, that's, that's, the, that's really it. That's really the, the summary here. I truly appreciate everybody uh, smashing that like button. Subscribe if you want to get more commentary like this. Um, we are live for all the key events, uh, macro and not, cover all the ma major events in the stock market. Um, not really wanting it to go one way or the other, just kind of wanting to report it as it comes in, which I think is, is really important. So thank you very much for watching. I appreciate that to hear old former economist, banker and so on uh, says thank you. Uh, my cat says thank you. As well, Taluda managed to sleep through all of it. That's how chief financial analysts work. Very sleepy she is. So thanks for tuning in, guys. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video.